remember how your family taught you about wealth and sort of how that conversation was broached by your parents and your relatives? To answer the question shortly, no, we did not speak about money. Money mm -hmm. was not something you talk about. It's private. But there are messages around wealth that we are sometimes conscious of and sometimes subconscious in projecting to our children. And they permeate kind of family lives. So in my family growing up, there was one really strong message. There were a few, but one really stood out, and that was responsibility. And it was a broad definition of responsibility. There was, on the one hand, our responsibility to the community to give back, whether it was in cultural heritage or in healthcare, we were deeply involved. And they were issues that were important to us as a family. They gave us an identity, not in the public, as a family, it was a personal identity mm -hmm. of things that we shared and that mattered to us and that we wanted to support and grow. And then on the other side of responsibility, there was the personal side of we we're responsible to each other for what we have to future generations. We're stewards. We are privileged to have these things and we need to appreciate it, but we need to protect it and look after it. That wasn't the same as being given a work ethic, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, that was kind of missing from it in a way. It was a different kind of responsibility. And then um, we suddenly got, I was 10, my siblings and I were all different ages, but started to get very different messages around wealth when my father died. Our father died when we were quite young. And the messages we started getting were just completely different. It was, um, mm. you're looked after. This is managed. And what we saw was my mother, a 38-year-old widow with three young children, grappling with an inherited structure, trying to be informed, mm. not being at all prepared, and having been told, don't worry, you're, you know, you'll be fine. What makes it such an awkward thing to just simply prepare the next generation for the fact that, well, it didn't come from nothing and it's certainly not going to stay without you doing something about it? All families are different in their problems and what keeps them together and their values. But it's really interesting with the families that I work with, how often the same words are used to describe the feelings expectation, obligation, mm. questions of self-worth, privilege. And so it doesn't matter if you've been told you need to join the family business or if you've been made to feel that you have no place in the family business. These kind of sentiments create a burden. And I think the problem comes into two main areas not being adequately developed and prepared mm -hmm. on the one side and not having the right tools for communication on the other. Mm -hmm. So it's not that people aren't talking, but they maybe don't know how to communicate, how to actively listen. So um, an interesting Harvard Business Review report said that only 13% of families make it into the third generation. And the reason isn't management. It's not because they don't have good management. It's because there's been a collapse in trust and communication amongst each other. The need for having this kind of education and having these discussions is equal to men and women and everything in between in the family. And I think that this is absolutely true. The fact is, though, that it seems from the outside and from the discussions we're having and the data that there still seems to be a significant difference in how women and men are raised around their relationship with wealth and like how they perceive their responsibilities and how that also informs their work ethic or their definition of what is actually their opportunities in taking action with regards to the family legacy. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how you see that difference between the relationship? What I think is interesting is that certainly I find that 
because more wealth is moving into women's hands, we are seeing them influence it more. Whether it's how they're buying, it's how they're investing, how they're educating themselves or asking questions, and especially talking to their peers and their children. They often use in kind of now with talking about female investors, once, I don't know if you've heard it, but I seem to always hear it is, women don't want more, women want better. I actually think it's, it's, I think <laughs> it's true, but I don't think that's just about in an investment case that it's just aligning their investments with their, their values. Yes, that's true. But I think what it's coming down to is that women haven't felt prepared enough or they know that they're insecure with a lot of issues. So they want their daughters to be better prepared. I think oftentimes they think their sons just are, whether or not they're working in finance, but they're really, um, education is important for the daughters. And I mean, it is, we need to be educated and women are taking education as a way of emancipating themselves. I mean, we've still got a long way to go, but I, I think there's been a big improvement in a kind of our generation from our mothers to our generation, less so mm-hmm. from our grandmothers to our mothers. So I see that changing, that there are more groups for women to talk. Banks are increasingly speaking more about, you know, their women clients. But I mean, it's just not, it's just not there. There was this great UBS study a few years ago that 98% of widows and divorcees don't feel adequately prepared to deal with their finances, mm. 98%. And so even what banks are doing to prepare themselves isn't working because 60% of widows, I love this. I mean, it's just an extraordinary statistic. 60% of widows change their financial advisors on their husband's death. There you go. The critical skills to generate a healthy relationship with the family legacy, critical skills that I can acquire myself, that I can encourage others in my family to acquire, to have a normal relationship with wealth and then also enable a a normal conversation with my family around the, the subject of wealth. What would you say would be those skills that you would want anyone in that position to acquire ASAP? I would say be intentional, actively think about what it is that's important to you and that's important to your family, figure that out and then commit to it kind of purposefully. So that's kind of number one, be intentional, then develop your human capital. So This is a line I learned from Mara Harvey, and I don't know if you know her, and if not, I can only recommend her for your show. Mara Harvey was actually at UBS, and she left to write books to help educate children in in financial kind of literacy. And she said, give the gift of financial literacy. She has a Mm -hmm. wonderful series of books. And, um, you know, our understanding of money our relationship with money is formed by the age of seven i don't think one's ever too old to continue developing and there should be a joy of intellectual pursuit that we give to our children and to all of us as well as the joy of working so i think those skills are really important and i think if you've feel good about how you've developed. You've had the space to develop your skills and working inside of the family business, outside of the family business. You still need to know how to talk about it, communicate it, get the tools to do that. Um, Get people like me, your family advisors, you know, who are there to help, who aren't flogging a product to just help guide you in that process. Cause then we're not needed forever. We walk away and you've got those tools, you know, but you need the confidence to value yourself so yeah i guess those are the skills 